Welcome. We are so pleased and humbled at the incredible turnout today. It means so much to our leadership, congregants, the renovation committee, and to the speakers today that you all took time out of your weekend to be here in support of and celebrating this community. My name is Noah Mishkin. I am a former member of the board, passive member of the Renovation Committee, and a proud current participant of the Skokie Valley Aguda Jacob General Membership. Those of us familiar with construction have likely experienced how typical projects can often exceed both budget and schedules by about 20%. Given we started a few minutes late, I will still do my best to not honor that tradition here today and to keep our program running smoothly and on time. Re <laughs> reflecting briefly on the past 10 years and the past eight years since my family joined Skokie Valley, I never would have imagined what we see here today. On Shabbat, on holidays, a robust, thriving and connected community of multi-generational members, families and friends coming together in support of individual growth, spirituality, meaningful experience, and genuine love. Even with a strong foundation of values and principles supporting new efforts that began taking shape a decade ago, expectations paled in comparison to what we have seen over the years that followed. Look around at this room, this sanctuary, this sacred space, Something special like that does not happen quickly nor easily without the tireless efforts and contributions of so many. I feel fortunate to call this beautiful Beit Knesset my home and my happy place. It's where I come to connect with Hashem, reconnect with friends, and where my wife and I have chosen to raise our children through a life of Torah, mitzvot, chesed, and kindness. We gather here today for this momentous Chanukat Habayit, a dedication of a sacred space. Shehechianu v'kiyamanu v'higianu l'azman hazeh. He has granted us life, sustained us, and enabled us to reach this occasion. You're about to hear from a collection of wonderful speakers today that have each helped shape and influence the direction of this beautiful sanctuary and the congregation it represents. Our first speaker today, together with her husband as significant donors, has contributed greatly as a global Jewish leader on behalf of this community for decades and throughout this design and renovation process. She is our unofficial UN ambassador and has been a leader and an active member since the founding of this shul. She represents the best of our values, passion, and compassion maintaining the historical significance and principles Skokie Valley was founded upon while infusing a new sense of wisdom, outlook, vision, and as an agent of change toward our bright future. Please welcome Leah Rison. As one of the oldest in both age and show membership, I've been asked to recount some history. In the 1950s, there was an exodus, a mass exodus of Jews from the west and south sides of Chicago to the far north and suburbs. At the HTC, the Chicago Yeshiva, which supplied rabbis to Orthodox congregations in the Midwest, there was great angst great concern. Jews in the new communities refused to join a shul with the Mechitza. Was this the end of Orthodox Judaism in Chicago? The yeshiva took a calculated risk. They would allow their graduates to accept rabbinical positions at shuls which maintained Orthodox halacha, but without a Mechitza. The shuls would be called traditional and would have membership in the Orthodox movement. Thus, Sochi Valley 
traditional synagogue was born. Later, it was joined by members of Agudath Jacob. Now, during the following decades, another major change occurred in the United States. Jewish parents decided their children should have advanced Jewish education on par with their secular education. However, when these children graduated 12 years of Orthodox day schools, they were uncomfortable with traditional shuls who had professional chazans, paid Torah readers. These youth knew how to daven. They knew how to lead davening. They knew how to chant Torah. They wanted to use these skills. In addition, they were embarrassed davening without a mechitza. Young women who had acquired the same skills and education refused to be passive ghost daveners. In this community, the young envisioned an Orthodox rabbi who would assume leadership in both the Jewish and Chicago communities. So they enthusiastically wooed Ari Hart to become the Shul's rabbi. He accepted. The young people heralded the demise of traditional shuls and the birth of modern Orthodox shuls in the Midwest. The result is the new Skokie Valley Aguda Jacob Synagogue, which truly experienced Tchiat HaMetim, resurrection of the dead. The history of our shul could be summed up by a quote from Rav Cook. Yashan Yitchadesh, the old shall be renewed and the new shall be made holy. You know, there's a true story of Ava Kovner. He was the Hebrew poet, the resistance fighter of the Litvak of the uh, Vilna Ghetto, and the leader of a Sub Rosa group called the Avengers, which found and killed hidden Nazis who had escaped judgment. Kovner made Aliyah in 1947. Although he was in a Jewish state, he felt so alone and alienated. His relationship to God and man had been weakened by the ashes of Auschwitz. One day, a man requested Kovner to join nine men to form a minion. Kovner didn't daven anymore, but he said, sure, why not? What difference? He put on a kippah and joined the men in prayer. And as the davening progressed, he looked about and he saw fellow Jews, men just like himself. And suddenly he felt he belonged to a community. He felt he had been counted and needed. Years later, Kovner developed the idea for the Diaspora Museum in Tel Aviv, which just went, underwent renovation too. Kovner even designed a special corner called The Minion. One day, Kovner was in the museum, and tourists were viewing the Minion exhibit. And one tourist exclaimed, this Minion exhibit is a disgrace. Some Amho Oris, some ignoramus built it. Look at it. There are nine wax figures in it. Everyone knows a Minion needs 10 men. Where is that tenth man? Kovner replied, Sir, that tenth man? You are that tenth man. Without you, there is no minion. My dear friends, our wonderful Shul Sanctuary depends on you and me to make it alive and vibrant. We must be the volunteers of time, money, Shul attendance. Without us, there is no minion. To paraphrase Mishlei, the book of Proverbs, let our work in this new sanctuary praise us in the gates of our community. To conclude, I'm going to raise an invisible glass for a toast. We'll fill it later. <laughs> Mazel tov to all of us for our past achievements, but more importantly, let us ensure future triumphs and future minyanim. Let success breed success. L'chayim.
forgot when planning today's events that I had to follow Leia. <laughs> Thank you, Leia. <laughs> to successfully design a space that properly satisfies the needs of a client requires a level of intimate knowledge, emotional connection, and sympathetic insight. To succeed, an architect must understand the intended scope while anticipating the yet realized needs of the client and potential use of the program in order to deliver the right masterful plan that far exceeds one's imagination. Finding the right architect for this project demanded someone who could personally relate to our needs and one highly skilled and experienced to become the visionary, turning concept into reality. Growing up within a modern orthodox setting, she understands our community values and is far more than an architect. She is a deeply spiritual and philosophical thinker of Torah and its influence within the conceptual designing of sacred spaces. It is my pleasure to welcome Esther Sperber. Thank you everyone for inviting me and for the opportunity to work with you and to celebrate with you. Um, when thinking about what I could say in this joyous occasion, um, I was thinking about the parsha that we just read, Bamidbar, and the parsha we're going to read after Shavuot um, Naso. And parsha Naso, after the story of all many different stories, but um, the story of all the Nesi'im bringing their gifts um, ends with Chanukat Mishkan, the uh, dedication of the Mishkan. And the last pasuk is Bevo Moshe el Oel Moed Ledaberito. And when Moshe came into the tent of the covenant, or the tent of the meeting, um, the Mishkan, Ledaberito, Vayishma'it akol midaber elav me'al ha'kaporet, and he heard the voice speaking to him, Above the kaporet, asher alarona edut and the ark niben shna kovin yedaber. The word nidaber elav is a little bit peculiar. It's the reflexive tense in Hebrew, hitpael, and it's the word the, the tense we use to say things like lehit labesh to dress yourself or lehit kalech to take a shower. So it's an action that someone does upon themselves. And Rashi asks, why, why, is it, why is the Torah using this word midaber? And Rashi says, Kmo midaber, kvodo shel mala, lomar ken midaber beno leven atzmo, Moshe shomea. Moshe goes into the Mishkan and hears God talking to himself, and Moshe is standing there and listening. And I thought this is a beautiful way to think about this mishkan, this holy space, this synagogue. Um, what the Torah is saying is that the people created this space, which is kind of like an instrument. It tunes into this spiritual voice and allows people who enter it with the right, right mindset to hear this chatter of God chattering amongst God's self, whatever that means. There's some kind of godliness in the world that when Moshe enters the Mishkan, he, he can hear. And I think this is the vision that the, your community and your rabbi and I hope we were able to help to create, to create a space that is a kind of an instrument that can reverberate holiness and community and joy and also moments of sorrow and allow us to experience those kind of moments together. And as an architect, I feel like my job is to listen to what my clients and congregations are looking for and to try to think of how to translate those wishes into something that is a physical space. So people might say, you know, we want a place that's welcoming. We want a place that pe people feel um, comfortable. We want a place where people can hear and see, um, where there's bright enough light to read your, your siddur, or where wherever we sit, we can hear the rabbi. And then 
You know, it is taking those wishes, those um, wishes which are for beauty, for inclusiveness, for accessibility, for welcoming, um, and translating them into something that can be built and created. And with a, a big team, it's not just me, and it includes Amy Riker and Sue and the committee and the rabbi and our contractors, I hope we were able to take this space which has really interesting bones but was quite dark and quite acoustically challenging and really not very inviting and not uplifting and create a space that feels like that kind of vessel that can reverberate the sound of God in the world and the sounds of people praying together um, and becoming a better and more inclusive and more meaningful community. So thank you for that opportunity. Thank you, Esther. Amy Riker is an award-winning architect, exhibition designer, and designer of Judaica. Since 1996, when she won second place in the Philip and Sylvia Spurtis Judaica Prize for her Seder plate, she has participated in invited juried exhibitions in museums around the world. Her work can be seen on display at the Jewish Museum in New York, the Jewish Museum in Vienna, the Yale University Art Gallery, and the San Francisco Contemporary Jewish Museum. She received her BA and MArc from Yale University and combines her studio work with teaching at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Furthermore, she is a beloved member of our very own congregation here at Skokie Valley and a vital component of our renovation committee. As an artist and architect, she is responsible for designing the beautifully elegant and symbolic Aron Kodesh, the Shulchan, and the Ner Tami. These are our current kalim with our place of, within our place of worship, the vessels used in our prayer service. Please welcome and celebrate Amy Riker. Thank you, that's a much more elaborate introduction. <laughs> Most importantly, um, I'm a member of this community and as I mentioned earlier to a smaller group, there's always a lot of anxiety in uh, coming to Shul where you're responsible for a project that is so important to so many people and people have such strong opinions about. And um, you know, my dominating experience has turned largely into being a punch list experience in the Shabbat morning, but hopefully that will ease out and I'll be able to focus again on, on higher pursuits. <laughs> Um, so every design project, um, as I'm sure Esther will confirm, is a kind of synthesis of the challenges that the institutional needs bring. You know, how many tours are we supposed to store? What's the choreography of our Shabbat service? How do we run high holidays? Is the room open or closed during most of the service? Um, as well as negotiating with the existing site or existing building, uh, which presented challenges and opportunities in this case as well as a kind of symbolic program. What, how do we want to articulate the values of the community uh, through design and through uh, the very sacred task of Shudor Mitzvah or beautifying the mitzvah of storing and displaying um, the, the Torahs through reading the Torah, through the Torah reading table, etc. So I'd just like to share a little bit of the sort of origin stories uh, of some of these rather unconventional forms that you're, you're looking at here today. Um, in thinking about both the architecture of the space as well as the ethos of the community as really so beautifully articulated constantly by our wonderful rabbi, uh, Ari Hart, um, it seemed interesting to explore the idea of the shattering and of the vessels, which then results in our charge to sort of recollect uh, and restore the world through so the, um, if you're probably very familiar with the Kabbalistic Lurianic uh, story of the breaking of the vessels, this is this great primordial drama in which before creation, God contracted himself and in that little leftover vacuum kind of space, 
created vessels of light that sort of poured from the divine self into these vessels. Well, the divine light was so powerful that it shattered the vessels. And those little shards of light, sparks of which occur everywhere in our physical and spiritual world. And I think something that is very close to the values of this congregation is the idea that through prayer, we collect these sparks spiritually and through our actions in the world, through social justice or service to our community and the larger city or country beyond, we really are responsible for collecting and restoring those sparks in order to heal and restore the world. So those are values that I think very much reflect the energy and ethos of this community. So I wanted to explore the idea of shards dispersed and recollected uh, in the Nir Tamid and the Nir Tamid 1.0, which is now a <laughs> sculptural evocation of shards in the landscape uh, on the right hand side. Uh, this idea of the shards and the sort of brokenness that then comes together through Torah is also expressed in the sort of asymmetrical design of the, the Aram Kodesh here, um, with a kind of translucent face, uh, which almost is like a talus fabric. Um, there's another reference uh, in Kabbalistic lore to the Torah being made up of individual divine letters, which themselves are fragments of light. So this idea of collecting gathering, reconstituting divine light is really a theme that kind of reverberates through this liturgical furniture and I hope helps focus and reinforce those values that are so near and dear and constitute what's so great about this community. Thank you. I want to uh welcome some special uh, distinguished guests here today from our broader community. Uh, first, I just want to welcome uh, Skokie Mayor George Van Dusen. Uh, I want to welcome David Jacobson, President of Chicago Jewish Funerals, <laughs> Reverend Hannah Hawkinson of St. Timothy Lutheran Church, uh, Rabbi Andrea London of Beth Bennett Synagogue, Pastor Tony Beal from United Methodist Church. I want to welcome and thank Larry Englehart, who I love seeing at all these events and is from Deja Views, uh, a sponsor today for our photos. So thank you, Larry. I'd also like to welcome Rabbi Michael Weinberg from Temple of Beth Israel, our neighbors right across the street. Rabbi Benachem Linzer of Hillel Torah. I'd also like to welcome Mike Houston, who is the president of Houston Protection, who helps, along with his crew, keep us safe every single week. And because I can, I'd like to uh, welcome my parents, Sherwin and Jan Michigan. Uh, at this point, I'd like everyone to uh, reach beneath your seat, where you will find an appeal card. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Actually, I am very proud to say that this, this uh, portion, this phase, and the most important uh, phase of this entire renovation process is actually fully paid for, which is an incredible accomplishment. Yeah. Although many of you have had the pleasure of hearing the wonderful outreach appeals from our next two speakers, that's not why they're here today. As the current president of Skokie Valley Good with Jacob, Brian Altgold is a very brave person, but also quite perfect for this role. As a professional with expert knowledge surrounding learning and development, Brian understands the fundamental principles of supporting individuals and community through growth and transformation while pushing toward qualitative improvement. He has been a confident and calming presence through this massively complex and incredible remodel. And if this doesn't work out, I'm confident in his other skills as I've seen his handiwork on the, on the farm. <laughs> as our most recent former president, Debbie Eisenstein, accepted the nomination for this role as at a most challenging and pivotal moment and was truly the individual who shepherded this process along. Enough couldn't be said here today 
about her deep and inspirational leadership. Debbie's involvement and commitment to this project and the Renov Renovation Committee has been the driving force and without whom this project likely would never have happened. Please continue your applause. I give you Brian Alco and Debbie Eisenstein. Boy, I should just sit down, right? Thank you, Noah. The rebirth of Skokie Valley, as Leah was saying, was accomplished by a dedicated membership. Um, and then we were in possession of a building with serious deferred maintenance, no cash reserves, and a prayer space not conducive to the vision of our community. Minor facelifts and improvements of some of the spaces were done with very creative and low cost options, but major renovations could only be dreamed about someday. And then March 2020, we found ourselves in a pandemic, lockdown. In between the craziness of Zoom meetings, economic uncertainty, fear, and anxiety, we were offered a lead anonymous gift to renovate the sanctuary. With the support of the board of directors and our membership, we embrace this opportunity to renovate with confidence for our future and turning this challenge into a blessing. One of the many wonderful things about being at this show is that I get to work with dedicated people who are also my friends. I told Michael and Rachel Stein that this project could only happen, sorry Noah, if someone agreed to shepherd the process and be on top of all the details, and they agreed. Their enthusiasm was contagious as they raised the necessary funds, hired our wonderful architects, design team and contractors, led a renovation committee, made countless decisions, spent hours on site, the list goes on and on. We were close friends before, and I'm happy to say that we are still friends. <laughs> After three years of meetings, delays, frustrations, selections, and voila, look what we did. So on behalf of the Board of Directors of Skokie Valley, it is my great pleasure to thank our major donors including Jeff Ader, in memory of Mordecai Aloni and Edith Solomon, Nina Black and Avery Hart, Debbie and Dan Eisenstein, Sharon and Yossi Goldberger, in memory of Selma Fader, Amy Kenter and Michael Shapiro, in memory of Chuck Cohn, Becca Linden and Rabbi Ari Hart, Elisa and Steve Lukovich, the Menorah family, Suzanne and Noah Mishkin, Rabbi Miriam and no Rabbi Marianne Novak and Noam Stadlin, Toby and Sherwin Pogren, Leah and Edward Bryson, Amy Reichert and Sam Fleischacker, Gail and Eric Rothner, Rachel Stein and Michael Stein, and Lori and Milton Wachlock. A couple other uh, thank yous that really brought today together. I would like to thank uh, Laura Rabinowitz and her amazing committee for the reception that was done. Ariel Logel for organizing a youth program today. And our amazing office and building staff, including Karen, Rose, Mark, and Oswaldo. Thank you. It is a rare privilege one gets to meet a dynamic couple for whom community and service are values they live by and practices they demonstrate in every facet of their lives. And it's a whole other privilege when one gets to call them friends. Rachel and Michael Stein have been instrumental in the initiative and realization of this immense revitalization and transformation of our sanctuary. Most people evaluate how they can meaningfully best contribute time, energy, 
money? They did all three. Sorry, they happily, <laughs> generously, and passionately fulfilled all three of those categories. And they did it by running toward this challenge, opportunity, mitzvah. They are visionaries who imagined what could be without waiting for a never to be perfect timing. At the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, during an incredibly unstable and emotionally stressful period, they saw through this trepidatious undertaking, pushing us beyond our perceived comfort zone to accomplish the not yet recognized nor accepted needs of our growing community. Our congregation will forever be grateful for their generosity and spirit. It is my pleasure to introduce Rachel and Michael Stein. it does take a village, and in this case, I am so thankful for the very talented members of our Reno committee. Amy Reichardt, Noah Mishkin, Michelle Alkel, David Bilo, Michael Stein, and Svi Feitel. Um, and also, of course, our architect team of Esther Sperber and Sue Orbach, and definitely uh, Hakarad Hatov to Debbie Eisenstein, Rob Ari, and really the whole Skokie Valley Board who was so supportive. This project was definitely a communal effort. One of the remarkable qualities of Skokie Valley is our warm, inviting community. And this is not an accident. Community building is a defining value of our show. So it's not surprising that our committee put community at the center of our work. We began with little more than a dream in the summer of 2019. We then spent two years planning before construction work began in 2021. Input from our members was central to our process. Surveys, town hall meetings, discussions, phone calls, Zoom meetings, and lots of listening. What were our priorities? Our members told us. Inclusivity, accessibility, clean, comfortable bathrooms, windows that open to the world, an eastward facing sanctuary, a light filled space where we maximize the ability to see and hear for both sides of the Mechitza. We even asked members to vote for their favorite chair. <laughs> this reno was more than an update, more than merely new decor. It was a value-based renovation to create a Makom Kadosh, a new sanctuary that not only meets our needs, but reflects who we are and what we believe and how we dive it. We are so very grateful to the small group of people we asked to invest in this project at the start of COVID, who responded very generously without fanfare or requests for naming or recognition. We would not be here today without their support. Although their names are not on the plaque, I was especially moved and inspired by the many smaller donors, members who weren't asked but wanted to support us and sent in what they could to be part of this remarkable project. Thank you. You represent the very best of the Skokie Valley community. During our planning, our focus was the future, while listening to our current members in the present. But we were always mindful of our past. It feels like we have literally and figuratively returned to the original foundations of the shoal while bringing the full potential of this space to life. We hope this renovation honors and pays tribute to the past, the generations of Skokie Valley members who came before us, as we renew our commitment to the past, present, and future of the Skokie Valley community. There it is. May God bless us and renew our days as of old. Chadesh Aminu Kekedem. I want to just give uh, two call outs. First, first and foremost, to my wife Rachel. Uh, <laughs> it was a pleasure for me to, to work with her in this kind of capacity after so many years of marriage and doing all sorts of other types of projects. This was a, a new one and it was uh, inspiring. And, and uh, really, I, I, I'm very grateful, and, and I know everyone else here is grateful for all of her work. And the other shout out I want to give, I'm not sure he's here, is to my 
business partner and friend, Eric Rothner, who, whose donation, uh, his donation was particularly significant and, and, and he also has taught both me and Rachel over the years about the importance of generous and intense uh, charitable giving. He's really been an inspiration for that. Uh, the, the only thing I want to add uh, to all these other wonderful comments is that when um, Ravari and I started talking about trying to do this project at the beginning of COVID, there was a lot of hesitation. There's a lot of people that, you know, we get, there's a lot going on, what's the future going to be? And uh, right about then, uh, Ravari and I looked at the Haftorah. The Haftorah, when Yirmiyahu is told by God on the on the eve of the destruction of the kingdom to go uh, redeem some land, invest in, in real estate, in, despite an impending destruction. And he does that. And, uh, uh, you know, the message is fairly obvious. It's, you know, that the future is not going to be as dark as the present might feel. And uh, that was an inspiration to Ravari and me to, to see that, you know, as hard as it was at the beginning of COVID, we could use that, you know, we could overcome that hesitancy, overcome those fears, and, and really, uh, you know, push something ahead that, that, that was based on a belief in the future and what the future would hold. And uh, I'm pleased to say, you know, the, the neshama of this building came out in this renovation that, that Esther, uh, 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 it led so so effectively, but you know the, the fact that these arches are the original arches, those doors are the original doors. It's all the same place, and and the neshama came out, and, and I'm very grateful to everybody in this room for making this community and for helping make this whole thing a reality. Thank you. weeks ago, I made a delightful discovery. We proudly boast a Google rating of 4.7, <laughs> a rare achievement in the business world, unless you're Ken's Diner or Wrigley Field, each with a 4.8 respectively. Even in candy stores, where happiness is literally sold by the pound, struggle to meet, meet these ratings. <laughs> Funeral homes, however, <laughs> nearly perfect 5.0 across the board. <laughs> Doing something right. Our next speaker is someone who is doing more than just something right. If he had his own Google profile, the reviews of his craft would be glowing and how they've transformed a community in ways we couldn't have seen coming. My own review, however, would differ slightly in that I can honestly tell you, along with a handful of others, that we saw this coming well before he even realized he was a candidate for a yet-to-be-defined or established position of Maradatra. Six years ago, after a beautiful Shabbat where he was a scholar in residence, the moment after Havdalah, board members began receiving a barrage of text messages and phone calls expressing their appreciation of his various Divrei Torah from the weekend, and if we might be considering him as our next rabbinical leader at the shul. He is someone that has become my own spiritual Sherpa, moral compass, and a close friend. Never have I ever swam in the Arctic cold November waters of Lake Michigan at dawn with my rabbi, <laughs> Ricky, Michael, you were there. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege and honor to welcome up Rav Ari Hart. Celebration. A little Torah. The Shulchan Aruch, the Code of Jewish Law, and Orachaim, Simonai, 
discusses the physical requirements for a synagogue, for a synagogue building. And it says, Sarich liftoach tachim, o chalonot. You have to open windows or openings. Keneged Yerushalayim, facing Jerusalem. Kedeli yitzpalel kenegdam, to pray towards them. Tzarich liftoach tachim, you have to open openings. The Beit Yosef offers different opinions from the Rishonim on why we have to open these openings. Rashi says, Shachalonot gormim lo shikhevan libo shomistakel klapei shamayim. That the windows cause us to look up. They cause us to look up, to look up to the sky, to see God's creation. The blue sky, the trees, the clouds, the seasons, the snow, the rain, the sun. That brings out that sense of wonder and awe into our spirituality. A different interpretation comes from Rabbeinu Yonah, who says, Through the light that comes in, he'll be calm. He'll be able to focus. The light, says Rabbeinu Yonah, helps you see. When it's dark, you're confused. When you have light, you can focus. When one cannot see, one cannot focus. And so too here in this space, which has been designed so beautifully. I would argue that if one cannot see, if one cannot hear, if one cannot access, one cannot pray properly. This design has made this room so much more accessible. The light, the sound, the ramps make it possible for each and every one of us to access, to see, to hear, to participate. The Rambam offers a third idea. He says it's about focusing our spiritual gaze towards Yerushalayim, towards Jerusalem. And it's so important now as a community, now and always, to focus our tefillot for safety and peace towards Eretz Yisrael, to Medinat Yisrael, and Am Yisrael. And now we face in that direction. These windows, these windows connect us to the world. These windows are a portal to what's happening on the outside to come in, and for us to reach out. A window is an invitation to see and to be seen by those beyond our walls. And for me, that's what I believe is the ultimate vision of any shul, and especially this shul. The very first construction project, the Mishkan, the tabernacle, God tells the children of Israel to build a house for a very specific purpose. Build a house, the shachanti betochan, so I may dwell amongst you. God wants to live among us, and that's the purpose of sacred architecture. This is a vision of sacred space that's a force that brings godliness into our world, into our communities, and thereby transforms the world for the better. This building, Skokie Valley Wood of Jacob, is here to help God dwell in our hearts, in our community, in our city, in our state, and in our world. We have to open openings, and it's opened us. So much has already happened in this space. So much life has happened in this space already in its short time we've been celebrating in it. We've prayed here, we've studied here, we've held weddings and funerals and barabat mitzvahs and verses and baby namings. We've laughed, we've cried, we've grieved, we've sung, we've wept. We've connected to one another and we've connected to God. And God willing, this space will hold thousands of people for decades and decades to come in those sacred activities. Sarich liftoach tachim. We have to open openings. And there are sanctuary openings. The sanctuary renovation is complete. We have many more physical openings to open in this building. This building awaits further transformation. We need a truly accessible front entrance. We have a social hall in need of renovation. We have a community garden to plant. We have a new playground for our children to build. We have enhanced security members we have to establish. All these remain to be accomplished. And with the generosity and the spirit of possibility of this community, I'm confident we'll open those openings too in the years to come. But we need to keep opening spiritually as well. What we've opened here, what's been opened up in Skokie, is something that is so needed in this world today. It's what the founders of this shul believed in. And it's what those who orchestrated its renaissance 10 years ago believed as well. It's a belief in a community that's vibrant, a community that's orthodox and rooted in halakha and tradition, but also, without apology, orthodox and reaching out 
orthodox and inclusive, orthodox and welcoming, a community committed to deep Torah learning and to soulful, uplifting prayer, an orthodox community that welcomes individuals of all backgrounds, of all orientations, a community that's an engine for goodness in the world around us, feeding and clothing the needy, releasing individuals from debt, building literacy centers on the south side of Chicago, a community that's deeply committed and connected to our homeland in Israel. The world needs these openings, and there's so much we have to do. And the only way to do it is to keep looking out those windows, to keep dreaming, to keep building together. I want to close by expressing our collective gratitude to every single person who donated, who led, every single person who showed up, every single person who believed in this vision, those who persevered through the lean years, those who joined more recently and didn't even know the old sanctuary. I want to thank all those from our community for the past decades on whose shoulders we stand. And Mrs. Abrams is here tonight. Mrs. Rosenblum is here tonight. Many other true legacy members of our community are here celebrating with us, and we're nothing without you and what your families built. Some of those people are remembered on the plaques of this building. Some are remembered in their hearts. Some, we don't even know their names. But each and every one of them matter, and we would not be here today if it were not for them. And finally, we express gratitude to God for Gadosh Baruch Hu, without whom none of this is possible and whom all of this is ultimately for. Zayom Asa Hashem, as we said this morning in Hallel. This is the day that God has made. Nagila v'nis Let us rejoice in it. Mazel Tov. Thank you, Ravari. This next portion is the one I've been looking forward to most. We have drawn a random name from the RSVP list, and that person will have to come and follow Ravari and give a speech. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, we've had a pleasure of hearing from an impressive roster of dynamic speakers on the incredible and devoted work for whom each has poured years of their lives into making Skokie Valley green. Again. On behalf of the entire, on behalf, <laughs> I tried, I, I just couldn't help myself. <laughs> uh, I want to again thank you, uh, Laura Rabinowitz and your entire uh, team who chaired this event uh, to make today possible. It was beautiful, still is beautiful. It will continue in the next room. Um, and to conclude this portion of the day, I'd like to invite uh, the children to come up, please, and we're going to sing Adon Alam. And following the conclusion of Adon Alam, I invite everyone here to join us in the social hall, music, dancing, food, drink, um, there are special tables also set for kids, so we encourage everyone to please come in and enjoy and continue celebrating. Thank you very much for coming out today. All the kids, it's just like Shul, come on up, there's a lot of